Praise God. Everyone, just prepare your minds during this time. Prepare your minds during this time. Welcome to it. thought came to mind you can keep playing the song to you hopefully everyone can still hear me uh, put your thumbs up if you can hear me so normally okay um so a thought was coming to mind concerning i don't know if it was a word but as that song was playing and Kaylee was talking about running into refuge the song was speaking about refuge when I was praying, I was praying about being secure, grounded, rooted, unshakable, unbreakable. And what was coming to me is that many more people would be spiritually minded if you was to take a step away from social media, if they was to take a step away from social media. But speaking of the church at large, if you were to step away from the mainstream narrative, God would be able to speak to you. And so those of us in the room that have been able to receive the revelation of the times, it's because we've been able to separate ourselves from the world and from worldly conversations. If there's one thing that would dilute the word of God in your life or God from speaking to you, it's carnal conversations. And social media is filled with carnal conversations. And so a lot of people who are supposed to be spiritual are, are short-sighted because they're too busy looking at what the news is presenting to you. And they can't discern between true news and fake news. Um, and that's where we're at today. People start to have dreams from fake news. People start to dream prophetic dreams from their imaginations. Not all prophetic dreams are from God. Many prophetic dreams are from the imagination or fear. And the only way to really make that distinction is if you've spent enough time away from trash in order to really receive from God. It's very difficult when you're filling your mind with garbage to then discern whether your dream is from God or not or whether this word is from God or not or whether this thought is from God or not. What are you filling your minds with? Are you filling your mind with your mom's opinion or your dad's opinion or your uncle and auntie's opinions? Are you filling your mind with what your, your, your friends say? Are you filling your mind with what colleagues say? Are you filling your mind with what God says? Because I guarantee you that if you fill your mind with what God says, things become clear and simple. The Bible says God gives understanding to the simple. You don't have to be academic. You just have to be simple. Problem with people, we're so overcomplicated. That's why Muslims can't get it. That's why the Jews can't get it. So we need to detox our minds from garbage. speak for the church at large because I believe in this group we've pretty much done that I believe that in this group we're at that place where we've decided to separate ourselves from carnal activity at large making it a part of our lives but yeah that's just what came to me how can people hear the voice of God or know what he's saying in this season if even if he was trying to speak to you, you're so busy with what, what every other preacher is saying, what every other Pentecostal preacher or Baptist preacher or Methodist preacher, or every other prophecy that you hear on YouTube, how can you even know when you're hearing a thousand different voices every day and you're only supposed to be hearing one? 
God made us to be governed by one voice, not a thousand. So check the voice that you're listening to. You have something to say, Kelly? I just saw um, a sword. So that's the sword that will cut down every lie tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the sword that will cut down every lie. May that sword in the name of Jesus cut down every lie. The sword of truth. The sword which Hebrew says is the word. Let the sword cut down every lie of our imagination. Every lie of social media. Every lie presented to us every day on the internet. Lord, may your sword tonight devour. May your sword tonight wage war against every lie. Hallelujah. May your sword tonight wage war against every lie of our imagination. Let the sword of the Spirit cut through every infiltrated voice of the enemy. Let the sword cut through every insecurity. Let the sword cut through every lie. We hold the sword tonight as we go through the word tonight. We hold the sword. May the sword cut away every blemish. And you can just fade that song out, Auntie. Welcome, Adi. Praise God. So the sword, may the sword do its work in us tonight as we dive into the word of God. May the word be at the forefront of our minds tonight with no distractions. May everyone be focused tonight with no distractions. This time belongs to God. Amen. So let's jump into where we left off. Shout to the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Let's jump in. So this is where we are, right, Nicole? Uh, Nicole can't respond, but yes, I'm. If anyone has, says otherwise, then speak now. Um, three hands for speakers. Three people that want to speak. Oh, where to? One. Tier two. Two it is. Uh, and after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullius, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation 
by your providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou would hear us or thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man, speaking of uh, Paul, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all of the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the nazarenes remember i said saints pay very close attention to what we're reading today and also the, the current times and the things that are transpiring that we're seeing everywhere because here we have the jews accusing other jews because of their zeal and calling apostle for a ringleader of a different sect of jews and today in the media we have the jews who are denouncing israel because they don't want trouble and then you have the zionist jews who are defending israel because the bible told them to so you have these different sects within judaism where they're fighting against each other and so as we're reading through just keep your eyes peeled to the way that the jews are behaving today especially the way they're selling out their land and also um, the strategies that they use within scripture. I believe God wants to speak to us concerning these things. So they're calling Paul a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also has gone about to profane the temple who we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom yourself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that you have been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because... Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they're accusing me of. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Both the just and the unjust will be resurrected, the wicked and the good. And wherein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and towards men? Notice that Apostle Paul keeps using the word conscience. Apostle Paul is always fighting to keep his conscience clean, and we need to do the same. Because a Christian with a broken conscience will fall away. And a Christian with a broken conscience can never preach the gospel and be bold because they live in guilt and shame. So may God purify our conscience in Jesus' name. He says, I exercise myself to have always a conscience that has no offense towards God and towards men. Let your consciences be clean, saints. That is a life free from sin. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to the nations and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me, or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of the way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. I just want to uh, point something out, and I pointed it out last week. You see there it says that way. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way. I don't know if anyone else has taken notice of this, but 
there was no name Christianity. It was called that way. It was called the way. <laughs> Later on, they were called Christians, but there was no Christianity. But I just, I think it's uh, quite significant and interesting that it's called that way or this because this particular prime minister knew the way or that way and it says it quite often speaking of being a follower of christ it's the way or that way so because he had more knowledge of that way he deferred them and said when lysias the chief captain shall come down i will know the uttermost of your matter and he commanded a centurion to keep paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come unto him um, I, again just going to re-emphasize on that because you see uh when it's called the way if somebody says what's your faith and you say the way right uh, the way or that way just just for for argument's sake you're actually pointing into a direction isn't it because the world is walking a certain way, but we're walking a different way. That's why they call it the way. Oh, you follow the way. Yeah, we follow. We as followers of Christ, we follow the way. Whose way? Jesus's way, which is contrary to the world's way. As I always used to say before, if you have a motorway, the life of a Christian should look like driving down the wrong side of a motorway. That's how our life should look. Like if you was driving down the wrong side of a motorway, and all the cars are coming in your direction and you're going that way. That's literally how Christ has called us to live in, contrary to the way the rest of the world think. And 24, I believe. Don't forbid not. Where are we? And when Felix heard these things in more perfect knowledge of the way, and Lysias the chief captain shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him and after a certain days uh certain days when felix came with his wife drusilla which was a jewess he sent for paul and heard him concerning the faith in christ see that there I heard him concerning his faith in christ and as he reasoned of righteousness temperance and judgment to come Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have when I have when I have come convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent him the of, oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So Felix, being the governor, trying to trying to mediate between doing what the Jews want him to do, but also, as we see, Felix himself is bringing his wife to hear the gospel and trembling at it. But Felix is Felix is in the position of Pilate again and at the last it says um 27 but after two years porcius festus right came into felix room and felix willing to show the jews pleasure he kept paul bound in prison so he kept paul bound in prison to please the jews he wanted to please the jews and we see this a lot in scripture whereby john the baptist's head was chopped off because herod was trying to please his niece or Jesus was condemned to the cross because Pilate's, Pilate was trying to silence the Jews. I'm going to keep using this example, but the George Floyd police officer that killed George Floyd was thrown under the bus and sent to prison for life because the police officers were trying to please the black community, even whether he done something wrong or not. And so many people are getting thrown under the bus because they're trying to please a particular crowd. And somehow that just lines up with what i was saying earlier that the jews are doing the same thing today with throwing israel under the bus denouncing israel singing down down israel to appease the muslims so that they don't get into trouble with muslims they're willing to sell out god that shows their zeal for god it's not actually for god i think kaylee may have mentioned it in the room or somebody but they love their tradition more than they love god and because they love their tradition more than they love God, they're willing to throw away Jerusalem and throw away Israel just to keep peace with the 
Muslims. That's not zeal. Therefore, the most zealous people for the word today should be the Christians, because we can see that the Jews themselves don't even have the zeal that they claim to have. Their zeal is for tradition and ritual, not for God. But when your zeal is for God, you will fight for God unto death, even if it means making enemies with Muslims and getting your head chopped off. You will, you will stand because you're zealous for God. And so I thank God for the men of God in Scripture that show us the example of what it looks like to stand for God without selling him out. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot to say concerning that chapter, but anyone is free to speak. Hello, um, just verse 24, when, um, when you were saying, when it said in the scripture, the way, and what just came to mind was that, um, sorry, let me read what I put, the way made me think of the narrow path, the way to eternal life. Amen. No. Sorry, I did that by accident, but um I guess I can share for anywhere. I just thought it was interesting how Felix trembled at hearing the word of God. But today, um, particularly English people will mock at the word of God. And it's funny because today uh, society looks at biblical people as backwards. But you can see that, if anything, they had a lot more wisdom because uh, to fear the Lord is basically the beginning of wisdom. So... Him, it's just interesting how he even he trembled at uh, hearing the gospel, even though he still compromised on that conscience because he still kept Paul bound to please the Jew. But I just think it's interesting that even him, who could have been prideful because of his position, still trembled at hearing the word of God, and just how people today literally will just mock like they don't even have that reverence for God um, anymore. And I know. The churches today have done a bit of a disservice and have caused God to be blasphemed, but you can kind of see the difference anyway between people back then and people today. Really good. And it is a good reminder that people back then wasn't just dumb peasants as we've been sold this lie in this generation as though we're so intellectual because we have science and they didn't know anything and they used to believe in gods but today we believe in doctors and uh, uh, scientists and philosophers but this is the thing when you look at people such as king charles right i believe that's the current king of this nation right and when he was being ordained as king and they used the olive oil from Jerusalem and the mountain of olives, you notice that even that generation prior to this, you see every generation, the fear of God dies down a piece by piece. King Charles is getting anointed by oil from Jerusalem. Yeah, people are mocking and scoffing and disgraced and making a mockery of the king. Nevertheless, even the queen and the king had a level of reverence towards God because it was it's actually the most basic form of uh, understanding. As you said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. It's actually basic understanding to fear God. As the word says, Satan fears God and trembles. And so we live in such an ugly generation, right, where people will just... Uh, you know, one of the worst things is the indifference towards God. So it's one thing mocking God. It's another thing like, yeah, I don't really have any feeling towards God, not even thinking about God, which is going through our lives until we crash and burn and die and face God. And um, so, yeah, when you look in the scripture and you see these presidents and these prime ministers and these leaders of, of, of the uh, Roman Empire and stuff and how there's a certain respect that even though they don't, this isn't their God, Funny that, isn't it? Even Pharaoh in Egypt is like, Yahweh is not my God, but I respect him because I see what he's doing. 
and these Greeks and Romans like, yeah, we have 300 gods that we worship, but there's something about Yahweh. There's something about Yeshua that we respect. King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he didn't worship Yahweh, but he gave respect to Yahweh and said everybody has to respect Daniel's God or Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's God. Um, we need to stand again today because we're in the time again when God is literally sending plagues like he is in Egypt. The problem is no one's interpreting the plagues, right? And so when there's no interpretation of the plagues, we leave it to the scientists to say, oh, it's a natural disaster because the earthquake is coming from the Antarctic Ocean and they're living on the waterline. Um, but I believe we're coming back to that time when the prime ministers and the governments, and, and as I was speaking that, I believe that there's people even such as Boris Johnson that have more fear of God than people realize. And that leads me on to the, what I actually wanted to say also. Even though these kings and these queens have the fear of God and these prime ministers, a lot of them have fear of God. Because of their compromises, even as Nikoja said in the last part of the chapter, it says that they kept Paul in prison to please the Jews. That's what makes the next generation lose the fear of God. You know how easy it is to pass down compromise to the next generation or to your children. Let's say you're a parent and you have the fear of God, but you don't demonstrate that fear of God to your children, then it multiplies. Then they grow up and they don't even care about God. Did you see that? So it starts with what actions do we take to demonstrate the fear of God? Because I can say inwardly I fear God. And the reality is a lot of them do, but they didn't pass that knowledge on. And then their children come out like, who is God? Like Pharaoh said, who's God? I don't know your God. When Moses came to him, who's your God? I'm not listening to your God. When it's our duty to pass down and the church hasn't done a good job. All we talk about prosperity, blessing, 10%, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, marriage and promotion. We haven't passed down the fear of the Lord. And so the next generation is like, God doesn't judge people anymore. God doesn't send plagues anymore because they've been sold a lie. So uh, I believe God is bringing back his fear into this generation. And those leaders who have sold out, like King Charles, like the queen herself, who feared God and covered her head because of biblical principles, but didn't pass that information as to why she does those things. She kept the fear of, the God, of God to herself, selfishly. Didn't pass it down. May God have mercy on her. Didn't pass it down. And so her children don't even believe in God after that. Uh, it's our duty to demonstrate the attributes of God that the next generation needs to know. Otherwise, they're not going to care about it. Very convicting. Amen. So there wasn't a lot going on in that chapter, so I'm happy to move on if, if no one else has anything else on that chapter to say. <clears throat> so it would be a way to and then tear. Can anyone hear me? Uh, it's saying I have a problem here, so I don't know if anyone can hear me. Um, if wait, if he's wait, I'm not, it's not it's not that loud. Speak again. Can you hear me? Um. So, can you? I can hear you now, but you were. Yeah, I can hear out, like, uh, Yeah, your one was in and out as well, but I can hear you now, so it should be good to continue. Oh, okay. So if uh, anything happens, just uh, please like raise a hand or something, um, so that I know. Well, hopefully, I get to see it. But that's that's this is what pops up on my screen. I just sent a screenshot on the group. Um, but yeah, I'll start reading. Um, <clears throat> now when Feastus was come into the province. After three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem. 
laying in wait in the way to kill him. But Festus, is it Festus or Festus? Festus. So let's just say Festus. Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly uh, thither. Uh, Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than 10 days, he went down unto Caesarea and the next day sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul be brought or be brought and when he was come the jews which came grievous complaints against paul which they could not prove while he answered for himself neither against the law of the jews neither against the temple nor yet against caesar have i offended anything at all but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. Nicole, can you... Please scroll up. I think there's a bit of a delay. For if I be an offender or have committed. There's a, I think there's a massive delay. That's, that's what's going on. It's like when you're speaking, it's cutting off. Is everyone else hearing it cut off? Put a thumbs up if it's cutting off for you. So there's a, a delay that's causing it to. Can you hear me? Nah, if you're responding to me like 20 seconds after. Are you able to log out and log back in? Uh, yeah, let me try that. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, sorry about that. Um, for if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered has thou appealed unto caesar unto caesar shalt thou go and after the certain days king agrippa and bernice came unto caesarea to salute festus and when they had been there many days festus declared paul's cause unto the king saying there is a certain man left in bonds by felix about whom when i was at jerusalem the chief priests and the elders of the jews informed me desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die, before that which he is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought non accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and what of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. And then Agrippa 
Agrippus said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing, with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth, and Festus said, Uh, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also when I found out when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not without to signify the crimes laid against him. Amen. Uh, so here, I, <clears throat> the only thing I really noticed um, is Paul's confidence you know, um, he had fought so much that he is confident in the fact that he's innocent, you know, um, because he said, if really, if truly I committed a crime, then send me out to the judgment seat, you know? So it was like, examine me, you know, I'll see whether what I had done is wrong or not. And so, Basically, Paul had a clean conscience, you know, and that's what we all should be aiming towards, you know, and it wasn't a thing of pride, you know, it was a, a thing of, I, I know my intentions, so you can put me there, I don't mind, I've been walking in the light, you know, it would have been uncomfortable if he had been walking in the dark all this time, you know, with his own intentions, he wouldn't have been able to say that. So, yeah, that's one thing I've noticed. So what I'm finding interesting is that we can see this perpetual narrative in Scripture. And I heard a Jewish scholar one time speaking on this, on how in the Bible, in the Torah, and what well, he was mostly speaking of the Torah, he said, God has this way of making the unbelievers look more righteous than his people. Uh, we see it a lot of time in scripture, we see it a lot of time. But here's some examples of it. Because even the Romans are like, the Jews, th this is what they're basically saying. Look what it says here in verse um, the 24, at the, near the top. It says, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews, uh, the Jews have dealt with me both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. So the Jews are running through the street, protesting and crying and begging the white man, begging the Roman government to kill their own man, to kill their own people, right? And the Roman government, the quote unquote white man, are saying, but it's not in our manner to kill people like this. They need to have a just cause for being delivered it's not right and so there's this confusion of the jews are harassing the the white man i'm just using that for the sake of argument to to uh, kill their own uh people of god um and and the uh, the white man the romans are being more just in that regard because they're like well of course they could have killed him a long time ago but they're letting him have this almost democratic court case experience like it's not right he needs to be tried first and it's not really democratic it's just human decency and righteousness so what i pick up from the chapter is just that these romans are operating in more righteousness than the very people who are supposed to be of god in fact what jesus calls the children of satan right they're, they're god's chosen nation but many of them belong to satan um, which is why we know all Jews will not be just be saved just because they're Jews, but rather those who God has handpicked and selected from the Jews. So that's mostly what I had to say. But if you pull it up again to where I just 
um, wanted to see the part where they was questioning him and he was talking about superstition, like they're, they're arguing over superstition. Um, yeah, somewhere around here. So against whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I suppose, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, <laughs> and one, and of one Jesus which was dead, who Paul affirmed to be alive. So the Romans are confused. He's like in verse eighteen. He's like. Um, Let's start from 17. Therefore, when they were come here without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. 18. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they didn't bring any accusation of the things that I thought they were going to accuse him of. What crime has he committed? Who did he rape? Who did he kill? What temple did he desecrate or destroy? What building did he burn down? But rather, 19, but instead they had certain questions against them of their own quote-unquote superstition because the romans are calling it superstition because remember they believe in many gods and many religions um and of this jesus person they're they're, they're, they're telling me about he, this jesus person which they say is dead but paul's saying he's alive or uh, and things so it's interesting like the confusion of the romans like they don't even want to be involved in this argument but yet god's chosen people are begging begging for a pagan nation who they know are pagan by the way and this is again this to me relates again to the same conversation i'm having today but they know that the romans are pagan in fact scripturally they were called dogs or gentiles um, and they're going to these dogs gentiles according to their consciences their mind and begging them to kill their own people who are of their own bloodline that's wickedness absolute wickedness It seems to be this same narrative of um, what happened to Jesus and Pilate knew out of envy they had delivered Jesus up and you can kind of see the same narrative with them that only a person that would deliver their own person up to pagan people would be again out of envy like uh, that's such a malicious thing to do like we're gonna do everything we can within our means to make sure we get revenge so that you can die basically that's such an envious thing to do the same with Jesus and again the same narrative they're looking at the situation with Paul and the man's thinking I can't put this man to death because in our eyes he's done nothing wrong he's done nothing worthy of death and it was the same with Jesus Pilate looked at Jesus and was like but what has he done worthy of death like this man's actually done nothing wrong and it's the same situation and um, so it's so funny that literally Paul is mirroring his life is mirroring Christ like you can literally see it's almost like reading the same story over again and um, it's quite miraculous so um, that's what really stood out to me yeah that's an awesome capital point Paul is imitating the life of Christ Paul is mirroring the life of Christ Paul in the scriptures says imitate me as I imitate Christ Paul oh, in the scriptures says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the only life I have left in the flesh is Christ. So this is why no one can ever say that anything Paul's going to teach us from today onwards, which is going to be the letters from Paul, right? Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, anything Paul teaches us is directly Christ. It's Christ. There's no argument as to, oh, no, that's Apostle Paul's opinion. I don't believe that one and that verse because Apostle Paul said it. That's not. No, Paul is 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 Christ. Uh, 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 Paul is living as Christ in the flesh, which is for all believers, by the way. It's not just for Paul. It's for everybody who's willing to die to the flesh. But Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And that means what it says. It means Paul is not living, but Christ is living inside of me, inside of him. And that means that even the advice that Paul gives is Christ. You see, when Paul sometimes says, now, this isn't a commandment. I'm just saying this. That's even Christ because he has the mind of Christ. So even that is to be taken seriously. 
Um, yeah, that's good. Paul's lifestyle, we can see it in his very actions, the way they're persecuting him, the way he's suffering, the way he's on the judgment seat, just like Christ was, the way the Jews are like, we hate this man, get rid of him. And can I just say one more thing? Paul's being accused more than any other disciple. He's being attacked. He's being condemned. And can I just mention a little bit why? Because when we read last week and we saw when James the Apostle was saying to Paul, Paul, you know what? The Jews don't like you. So I think what you should do, just go into the temple, show them that you still respect the temple. And Paul went into the temple and if everyone remembers, purified himself and did all of these rituals just to appease the Jews. But that wasn't even Paul. That was the other disciples that were trying to give him advice. And I think it's very, it's a tricky situation because these are apostles of God. These are men of God. I'm not going to down talk them. But a lot of them were even speaking in Paul's ear like, Paul, just just, you know, just let the Jews know that you're still a Jew. Just let them know that you still believe in circumcision. Just there was this, but Paul himself was the one, and, and this is the reason why he's the one being attacked the most. Because the other ones, in some ways, I'm not speaking down to the apostles, but in some ways the other the others were more willing to, you know, if I can get out of trouble this way, if I can. And Paul's like, as Oetu said, uh, uh, um, Oetu said that Paul's saying, if I committed a crime, kill me. I'm not trying to stop myself from dying. If, you, if, you, if, if I've done something worthy of death, take my life. He's not afraid to die as much as those. We saw it again last week when they're like, Paul, you know, you're going to die when you go to Jerusalem. We should, you shouldn't go. And Paul's like, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to be imprisoned. I'm ready to die. Praise the Lord. How much of us are ready to die for Jesus Christ? How much of us love Christ more than our own life? How much of us love this life more than we love God? How much of us love ourselves more than we love God? Because when we love him above everything, and this is what we were speaking about on Monday in our fellowship, setting our affections on, thing, on things above. Because when your affection is up there, you won't be concerned when you lose your house. You won't be concerned when you lose your job. You, because your promise is in heaven. Your promise is not on material things. Your promise is not on, oh my gosh, I've lost my money. What am I going to do? No, your promise is that when you die, Jesus is waiting for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Paul was definitely the most offensive, I would say. Um, what you were saying about even the other apostles without being disrespectful to them, were kind of whispering in Paul's ear. It just kind of reminds me how there was a bit of a compromise with some of the other apostles to the point where Paul had to rebuke Peter because around the Jews he would disassociate with the Gentiles. There was that kind of bending to please the Jews in a way to the point where Paul had to rebuke them because even Peter himself was the one that had the revelation that the gift of salvation was open to the Jews and he was the very one that was disassociating with the Gentiles when as soon as the Jews were around which was causing the other apostles to follow after that manner so Paul had to rebuke him openly so Paul was definitely the most offensive and that's why you can see that he was the most persecuted as well because Paul wouldn't bend in any way so it's really powerful um, just to see Paul's boldness and even how he suffered and how he was persecuted but still was bold in the midst of it as well Just a quick one. Paul reminds me of David in the way he suffered, in the way David speaks in the book of Psalms when King David is like, every day my life is on the edge of death. Everyone's against me. Everyone's surrounding me to kill me. Lord, my Lord, deliver me from my enemies. Um, everything David is saying in Psalms is the amount of suffering he went through. And when you look through the books of the letters of Paul, that again we're going to be going through apostle paul saying every day i'm being persecuted bombarded perplexed thrown in prison beaten whipped in chains unjustly and then at the end of it but i rejoice and i'm thankful that god counted me worthy to suffer disgrace apostle paul is celebrating praise the lord that he counted me worthy to be beaten for him we should have that mentality. We need to have that mentality. Thank you, Jesus, that I was beaten for you. Thank you that I was spat on for you. Thank you that I was shamed. Because the Bible actually says that those who are ridiculed and mocked for the name of Christ are those who have the spirit of God and the spirit of glory that rests upon them.
Praise God. Did anyone else have anything from that chapter? No, uh, but I just feel encouraged. Like it's not in vain to like suffer and stuff like that. Like there's going to be a reward at the end, and you know it shows that you belong to Christ. Because if Christ suffered and we are His children or you know disciples, then it just shows that we belong to Him. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11. Every worker is rewarded. The question is, are we working? So if anyone else doesn't have anything to say, then uh, we seem to be moving swiftly tonight. But, you know, every week will be will, will vary, you know. And so that's fine by me if anyone um, doesn't have anything more in this chapter. Um, yep. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy king agrippa because i shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof i am accused of the jews especially because i know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the jews wherefore i beseech thee i beseech thee to hear me patiently my manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at jerusalem know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straitest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests and when they were put to death I gave my voice against them and I put punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them I persecuted them even unto strange cities whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday O king I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me and when we were all fallen to the earth I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute. But rise and stand upon my, thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God 
and do works meet for repentance. But these causes the Jews the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things that than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I speak freely. But I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Amen. I think it's um like we just see it being repeated just how um a prophet's not accepted in his in his hometown and even just how um even within your own community how easy it is to be rejected immediately um, how they're with you when you're doing what they're doing but then as soon as you come with something contrary they're just so ready to um, dis disassociate, disown you and throw you under the bus and act like um, they never knew you which obviously is the case when you come to Christ but you know it's like how they're not even um, they, don't, they don't even consider the fact that you know what is what what happened for him to change so radically like that like a lot of people don't even want to know because they're not ready to give up what um is necessary in order to walk that that path but yeah I thought that was interesting no cool. Um, I really came off to just clap and encourage what Tia was saying, but um, there is something that I thought was interesting. Tia kind of touched on most of what I was going to say, but praise God. Um, but there was one thing that was highlighted as well in chapter, not chapter, in verse 14, where it says, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the hebrew tongue saul saul why persecutes you me it is hard for you to kick against the bricks and i said who are you lord and he said i am jesus whom thou persecutes so um it kind of shows again with the jews like paul being a zealous jew and pharisee and all that time even in being educated and stuff he still didn't know who god was because he was like who are you lord he didn't know who he was but he was a zealous um he was zealous for God's like commandments and stuff, a zealous Pharisee. But all that time he didn't know who God was and it kind of like shows even with most of the Jews, like they follow all their traditions and stuff like that, but they still don't know who God is until he reveals himself, of course. Like um, Paul had that experience with Jesus because Jesus revealed himself to him. But before that, Paul didn't know who he was, didn't know who God was until he had that experience with God. No one can come to the Father except through the Son, and no one can come to the Son except by the Father. <clears throat> mm. 
very good example of the Jews today. They know their tradition. They know their laws. They don't cut the sides of their hair. They don't eat pig and shrimp. They don't mix cotton with linen. Um, the the women don't show their hair, and they follow every law and commandment, which is all good if you're still under the law. But they have no idea who God is, and Jesus says himself you search the scriptures and the scriptures are supposed to point to me but you still don't know me they know the scriptures they know everything it says but they don't know him the revelation which is why they reject the new covenant and the new testament because they cannot see what god revealed and we see it right here so nothing has really changed isn't it it's like the same narrative we have here in the bible right where um they're rejecting him then they can't see him and they also can't see him today. And that's why that's why they can make statements such as we don't really need Israel as a political capital. They can say that because they they can't discern the heart of God. They can't dis all they know, all they know is just this the, the traditions that they hold on to. And that's very sad to have tradition without God. Tradition without God is what we call religion. That's what it is. Tradition without the spirit of God is religion. Religion is merely tradition without god it's something you follow because you follow it because you was taught to follow it but there's no spirit in, inspiration behind it we see it in the book of jeremiah where everybody's going into the temple and giving sacrifices and doing these things and god is outside of the temple sending jeremiah to the door of the temple telling them to repent repent so and i remember reading that as a baby christian wait god is not even in the temple he's not even in the synagogues he was outside sending a prophet to tell them that what they're doing is vain. What they're doing, he hates. But they were in there praying. They were in there giving uh, alms and doing deeds. And same today, Jewish people's in the synagogue banging their head against the wall, saying this is the holy wall and all this stuff. And God's, God's sending prophets to them to tell them, stop smashing your face into the wall and stop pinning things on your forehead because you've missed it. You've missed it. Um, very sad and so but there's a couple more things before Kaylee so that was response to Nicole what um, what uh, Tia said as well in in just you know the more you become zealous for God the more it creates uncomfort around you and most of us have experienced that but David Lynn in that clip I shared with you earlier Tia David Lynn when he was saying as a baby Christian he had a Muslim friend and then he said, but slowly that friend started to move away from me. As I, be He said something interesting. He said, as I became more serious for Christ. So you see, worldly friends can only stay around you as long as you don't become too serious for Christ. Um, that's just how it works. That's why the Bible says have no fellowship with unbelievers because they can only be in your midst or fellowship as long as you're not doing exactly what God told you to do. So as you begin to... It makes perfect sense what David Lynn said. And it happened to me as a baby Christian when my best friend, who was my cousin, my uncle's son, who was a Muslim, and we were best friends for 10 years. And as a baby Christian, I tried to, you know, you tried to maintain the relationship. You're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You're so good. You know, we can still get along. We can still. But there was a compromise that God didn't want. And as I began to grow in my faith and try and invite him and tell him, you know, this is such a wonderful thing God is doing. He just became more and more uncomfortable until I had to make a decision. Do I choose my family, my old life, or do I choose Christ? And I made my decision and lost the family, but I gained a new family. Praise the Lord for my new family. Um, so yeah, there was that. And then I think there was one more thing I wanted to say in in the, in the chapter. So if you just go back to the chapter to 11, then I'll let Kaylee speak. I shall let Kaylee speak after that. So just go back to the chapter in verse 11. I always, when there's a lot being said, I just try and remember a verse so that I remember what I wanted to do. I think it's something small. So verse 11 says something interesting. It says, and I punished them, speaking of Apostle Paul saying that he was punishing Christians before he became a Christian. He says, I punished them often in every synagogue and I compared held them to blaspheme did everyone notice that so paul was forcing believers like the taliban do with christians today he was forcing believers to blaspheme god otherwise i will throw you in prison otherwise you'll be killed kind of thing so paul was forcing christians to blaspheme their own god 
And it's just the, it's, it's, it's just the extremes of where he came from, telling people to blaspheme Christ onto the experience of Christ coming to him and him saying, wow, like, I didn't know you before, but now I know you, so praise God. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. So it's just the confirmation um, where you're saying, um, I'll just say what came to me when I was reading, um, just to do with the high priest and that, and how God wasn't with them, but he was with the disciples. So Jesus was always with the disciples, um, but he wasn't with them. And it just reminds me of like the church today, like in the building, he's not there, but he's with his chosen people that he has appointed. very good um it might be in the next chapter but the book of acts uh, maybe 27 says god does not live in buildings made by human hands god is not living in a church okay the church is not the holy place the holy place is the temple that the holy spirit lives in which is the body of christ which is the individual members who are a part of that body we are the church according to those who have the spirit of god God doesn't want to live in a dusty building. He doesn't. God doesn't want to live in a building that some pagan made. He doesn't want to live in a building that looks dressed up and idolized. He doesn't want that. He doesn't live there. He's, he's, most of the times he's not there. Uh, but where he does want to live is where he said he was going to live in the Old Testament. He said, I'll pour out my spirit. I will live in them. I will walk in them. Christ became the temple. Christ was the tabernacle. When Jesus died on the cross, the temple broke in half for a reason. Like how clear of a message could we get? The whole temple ripped in half. That was God desecrating his own temple because now he's given us the new temple, which was his body. And guess what? Now when we eat the body and the, drink the blood, that's us representing that we are now his body as a collective. So it's not a light thing that I'm saying. It's a scary and fearful thing. But God's living amongst us even now. Where two or three are gathered, where am I? I'm in their midst. God is in, amongst us now. For anyone who thought this is just a Bible study with a bunch of people that are just have, happy to be a Christian. No, no, no. This is Jesus in the midst teaching us through my voice. Jesus is speaking through my voice right now. Jesus is speaking through Owetu's voice right now. Jesus is speaking through Tia's voice right now. That's Christ. Let's not let's not downplay each other and think, oh, it's just Owetu, it's just Chuka. It's just no. This is Christ speaking revelation to us, through us, and to us. And so this is where God lives. Not in a cathedral. He lives here. He lives where we gather. The Bible says, I inhabit the praises of the saints. He lives in the midst of his saints in our physical bodies but also in us collectively so we thank god for that <laughs> i thought it was funny that paul said that he persecuted them even onto strange does it say countries? Let me quickly check. It was at the end of that part that you was reading, Chuka. And I pushed, punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even onto strange cities. Sorry, onto strange cities. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I don't know. I just got the image of Paul being that zealous that he was following them around persecuting people. But yeah. Now they're following him around, persecuting him. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes that seems to happen. Like you see that narrative in the Bible as well. That sometimes what some of the people do, it ends up happening to them. You know, kind of like a Jacob situation where he deceived his brother, and then his uncle deceived him. That kind of situation going on. Not saying that he's been being punished or anything, but it's just funny we there's a principle in the bible that we reap what we sow <clears throat> we see it in scripture we see it principally i see it in my own life right and uh, i wonder if anyone can relate to this 
The Bible will say that those who are laughing will be in sorrow, and those who are in sorrow will laugh, and those who are rich will be poor, and those who are poor will be rich. Speaking of coming to Christ, those who are slaves will now be free, and those who are free will now be slaves. What am I saying here? What is God saying here? There's this way that God humbles the believer. When I was in the world, I was a cool guy. I was a cool guy. Always, I couldn't leave my house without certain clothes. Couldn't leave my house without being fresh, perfumed. I always had this image to uphold, covering myself, hiding myself behind materials. And everybody knows my testimony. When I came to Christ, he stripped me of all that and made me go outside naked, not physically naked, not like Isaiah and David, but without my hat and without these things that I used to hide behind to show off behind and he and that was my humiliation and so what i'm saying is god has this way of reversing what you was to humble you so if you was the persecutor now you're going to be the persecuted okay if you was the cool guy now you're going to be the nerd if you was the nerd now you're going to be the cool guy god has a way of reversing the order so i had to become the nerd i had to become the fool the, the guy that used to walk around through the shopping center and talk to girls like I'm this cool guy. When I came to Christ, I was walking around with guys that looked like hippies playing guitars at first feeling humiliated, but eventually being humbled and becoming free from that which I attached myself to. So God has a way of humbling the rich. What did he say to the rich man? You want to be perfect? For you, you're going to have to sell everything and give it to the poor. Was that for everyone? Because, you know, some people say, oh, if you're a follower of Christ, you have to sell everything and give it to the poor. No, it's not. It wasn't for everyone. That was what he needed to be humble. That's what Kanye West needs to be humble. That's what Beyonce would need if she came to Christ. They need to give everything to the poor because their identity is in their riches. So God wants to reverse what you were so that he can humble you. Okay, Does that make sense to everyone? I was thinking that as you were speaking, God kind of makes he takes you and then makes you the opposite of what you were, um, which kind of makes sense because if you came to God and you was just the same, there's no real testimony in that. So even as we saw that Paul was telling his testimony, and I think he mentioned it earlier, Chuk, how it was two extremes from being the persecutor to the persecuted and how um, on fire he is now for God and the extreme that he was before where he was persecuting and causing people to blaspheme God um, kind of gives glory to God within itself that he's taught that person and transformed them to the opposite. As if he was to stay the same, there's no real testimony or fruits of you coming to Christ and being converted and being made new. Um, but it, it would just look like you're just the same person and there's been no transformation. So um, it kind of makes sense on many levels as well. I like what you said there at the end, and I'll let um, someone else speak. You said at the end, if they cannot see the change, how can they bring glory to God? Or how can they see the work of God if there's no difference? And so when the rich man comes to Christ and he becomes humbled in his riches, people can look and say, wow, God really humbled that man. He's really taking him down to human level. On the flip side, when the poor man comes to Christ, and this will make the prosperity Christians really happy, which we don't have any here. But when the poor man comes to Christ, God can sometimes have a way of exalting that poor man and making him prosperous. To be like, how can this poor man become prosperous? And, and so, again, it's the same principle we see it throughout the scripture that God wants to do something in your life. I was shy before. I was insecure before about everything, about how I look, about how tall I am, about my weight. And now I'm the complete opposite. I don't feel it. I don't feel the need to get my hair cut every week. I used to have to get my hair cut every week. I had so much to, things to prove, and now I have nothing to prove. And so that was me going from shy and secure. I couldn't speak. I couldn't even use vocabulary, and now I have quite a lot of vocabulary. And it wasn't from school. It was from the Bible. The words I used today, I didn't learn in school. When I was in school, I used to say, um, yeah, um, um, yeah, mm -mm, um, um. And God gave me vocabulary. Isn't that funny? Because we think we have to just be in school to learn vocabulary. God taught me how to speak. And um, and then on the flip side, when you're speaking, I was thinking, but also for the people that come to Christ and are too confident, God also wants to stop them from speaking. Does that make sense? The people that came, but they had arrogance and confidence from their old life, you need to sit down and you need to be humble. So God will make the arrogant guy quiet and he'll make the quiet guy not arrogant, but bold. 
um, the principles. Praise the Lord. Um, does anyone have anything to say on the chapter? Or if not the chapter, at least concerning what we're all talking about. Um, yeah, I can relate to what you're saying. Like when I was in the world, I was kind of like a person that would not uh, would defend myself. I would like um, a bit quite prideful, really, because I wouldn't back down to people or anyone. And now God is making me go through a lot of humbling by having to allow people to persecute me and that is something that I find really hard that I have to allow God to fight for me and not defend myself so I can see, I can see that it just making me laugh really <laughs> but yeah um yeah I've been I've gone through it I'm, I'm still going through it and even with my mom like when I was in the world I was very much disrespectful to adults like and um, talking back and everything and now god is making me to like respect adults and even so i have kids disrespect me so i know how it feels as well so yeah i know how it feels <laughs> when kids disrespect you and i used to do that when i was a teenager and stuff so yeah god will make you go through some things <laughs> so yeah thank you for that kelly that was very powerful I've seen the process, I've witnessed it firsthand of God humbling you. I get it. Just on that note, how does it feel then? How does it feel to have once been the person that defend myself you can't talk to me like that don't tell me what to do you know not letting kids bad you up how does it feel just a little experience of how it feels to then be on the other spectrum and i can also relate again i can relate in the in the life i used to live in and go into a different an opposite life but how does it feel for you to then have to hold your tongue to then have to you know take correction to then have to in terms of your neighbors go through the abuse or the the mockery and, and things how does it feel in christ i know it doesn't feel good physically but how does it feel in christ going through these things as you was just laughing about it and knowing that in your old person you would have been fighting back but now you have to silence yourself and take it like apostle paul is how does it feel at first um if i've been honest uh, it really 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 was hard because i would at first uh, defend myself but then what would happen is I'll make it worse for myself and then it would be this pattern if I defend myself it would be worse but if I humbled myself then it would be like God would fight for me so and yeah God corrects those he loves so um but I think over time it's kind of like been a benefit because there's a lot of things that I would get annoyed with or snap at easily I don't so much now so sometimes it, it is good to go through it because it's kind of like refining your character and stuff like that. so there's a lot of things now that wouldn't bother me the way it would be for but I'm not saying I'm perfect there's going to be times where I probably you know I need cry I need um, God's grace in it but um yeah I do see the benefit now having to go through it and the purging and stuff like that um but yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% there yet, but I know that I'm a lot better and I know that God will finish it in me. <laughs> Definitely a great testimony to share. I'm sure that's encouraging for a lot of people in the room. Yeah, I was definitely the worst of the worst. <laughs> uh, you know what, there's some things that if I could tell you what I'm, I'm going through is, and I just and it just makes me go back to the things what I did as a teenager and then I think, oh yeah, I'm just I'm getting actually what I did to somebody else back to me. <laughs> and I have to just allow it and show them Christ. So yeah, I just have to laugh now. Because before I couldn't see it, but now I'm seeing the things that I used to do is not happening to me. That's really, really good. Thank you for that.
Yeah, that was a heavy word. Does anyone have anything else to share? Dwayne, what's good? You just came to mind, bro. Are you with us? Are you well? Glad to have yeah, you here as well. Good. good. Yes, bro. Do you have anything to share concerning anything we're talking about or anything like that? Uh, nothing at the minute. No I problem. Did before, but all good. Oh. Okay, you had something before, but then. Yeah, I'll leave. Um, I always try to. I want to leave the spaces to make sure everyone gets to speak. Then I also don't want to drag it too long to make it not go on too long if not necessary as well. But yeah, hopefully it will come back to mind. And then, um, yeah, as I always say to everyone, just jump at the opportunities to just don't feel like you're butting in. I don't want anyone to feel like they're butting in. Sometimes you have to jump out um, and stuff. Or you could put your hands out like Haley always does. Or jump out. I'm not going to be, I won't be upset if anyone jumps out. I don't think it's, um, you know, if, if there's a, a silent gap, you can just jump in so that i don't want anyone to miss anything they have to say because everything all of us has to say like what katie just said was very profound which is why i thought let's just take a break on that because that's that's a testimony and it's very encouraging and important and humbling for every single one of us that we have to face the same things that we made other people face before we came to christ there's this humbling way about god and he would just put you you know let me give you one more example and then i'll let katie speak you are so proud and I would never do that kind of job and I would and then God will have you cleaning a toilet in McDonald's in public. And I and I don't say that to dishonor anyone who cleans toilets in McDonald's because you know that's somebody's job, it's their job. But just because I know that somewhere where a lot of people first of all, people wouldn't want to clean toilets. Second of all, they wouldn't want to do it in public, like in a public restaurant. And so but there's this way that God will allow that person who felt like they were big and felt like they deserve some, you know, uh, some praise. None of us deserve praise. We're all slaves. We're all servants to Christ. None of us deserve that. Oh, this isn't, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm above this. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. And so God will cause that person. Moses is the perfect example. Prince of Egypt, as we would like to call him. But he goes from being a prince to literally being a toilet cleaner because he was looking after sheep for the next 40 years and let's remind ourselves that uh, shepherds were an abomination to the egyptians the bible says the the egyptians abhorred jewish culture because of them being shepherds they saw that as a lowly disgraceful job and and imagine that egyptians saw shepherding looking after sheep as an abomination right but yet Moses, who was an Egyptian, living as an Egyptian as a prince, or even as the son of the princess, he then became a shepherd. So you see the perfect picture right there of the way God will humble you and make you clean sheep's poo. And it wasn't even his own sheep on top of it. So you've gone from royalty to looking after somebody else's sheep and cleaning their poo for 40 years. And guess what? At the end of that 40 years is when God was ready to speak to him, you see? 40 years, why? Because he was 40 years in Egypt, in luxury, in the empire, in royalty, with the gold jewelry and the gold that the Egyptians used to wear. But for God to humble Moses, it took 40 years of looking after poo poo, looking after caca, for 40 years. <laughs> 40 years and then in the end of that it says when god saw that he had moses attention god sometimes has to smash you all the way down just to get your attention you know i pray for my dad's salvation as we all pray for our parents to be saved one thing i always say to god is god please do it in a way that you don't have to smash his whole life down because i know something about my god if he has to put you in a sick bed there's something about my god that when i pray for family members sometimes i'm pleading with god god i want you to save my family but i would also like you to do it in a way that i don't have to see them suffer but then at the end of the prayer i say nevertheless let your will be done because if it means that that was the only way they were going to make it into the kingdom then i accept the suffering i don't want it i don't want to see it but if that's the only way for somebody to be saved is to be sick with a disease in a hospital bed or to have a devastating calamity happen to them wouldn't we choose that 
but it's not my first choice. So when I'm praying for my dad, like God save him, he's still healthy, he's still he could do, but he, my dad is quite proud. He's got this pride about him, this arrogance about him. It's like it's difficult because he's 75, he's healthy, but that health can turn around in a day. My dad is so healthy and confident in his health. That health can spin in a night. People going to sleep, Kobe Bryant, Black Panther actor, DMX, rappers and singers and celebrities. You go to sleep and you don't even wait. Who's who's guaranteed to wake up tomorrow? So what about the unbeliever? And so listen, it's like God has a way that if I have to bring you to your deathbed to be saved, he will do it. And so that's not, it's like the last thing that I ever want to see with anyone that I love coming to Christ. But at the same time, I'm like, God, if that's the only option that this person has to really be sick and suffer in order to humble themselves and accept you, I accept it as my last option, but please don't let it be the first option, Lord. Kaylee. Yeah, I was just going to speak about Moses, which was quite funny. Um, basically, just how um, before, like when God met him, he was struggling with his speech. And then it was like later on when he's like going and doing the commandments and stuff and speaking to the people, it's like his, um, his he had like his voice kind of like changed, kind of thing, like the way he spoke and stuff like that. Like before he was kind of like wanting his, brother to speak on his behalf but then later on uh, God was using his own voice to speak to thousands of people so yeah it's quite funny so if you're in the world and you struggle with your speech and then God will change you and make you like can speak I guess God's language kind of thing with boldness and um, not fearing um, how many people you're going to speak to so yeah that kind of came to mind Yeah, Kaylee's on fire today. On fire. Praise God. Dear brother, where to? Are you good? Dear sister Charlotte, hope you're well. Dear Tia, hope you're good. Dear Ade, hope you're blessed. Okay, let's go to the next chapter. We'll have more time to speak before we finish. I think we've got two more chapters, is that correct? Two more. So that means, okay, so who wants to be the next reader then? Wait. I always, I do prefer to read first and last. Um, is anyone that wants to be a spontaneous fourth reader? Is it the fourth one, two, three, four? Fourth reader, it can, it could be over to or tier again if you want to as well. I would prefer to read last. That's where I prefer to read. You want to read right to go ahead, bro. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and a certain other and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of a dramatum, um, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus and Macedonian of Thessalonica being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when he had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Sicilia, Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy and put us therein. And when he had sailed slowly many days and scars were come over against the Sidus, Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, 
over against Salmon and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lazia. Now when much was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished, admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I, have per I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. Not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attend to Phoenix and there to winter, which is a haven for, of Crete, and lie toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loose, loosing thence, they sailed close to Crete by Crete. But not looking after there arose it against a tempestuous wind called Euryclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claud Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used hops, undergrinding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands strake sail and so were driven and we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest the next day they light and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship and when neither sun and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us all hope that we should be saved was then taken away but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God had given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Sorry. <clears throat> But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up down Adria, about midnight the shipmen de de deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the delay. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boats into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then when they all of good cheer, then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. 
and we were in the ship 203 score and 16 souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with the shore into the which they were minded. If it were possible to thrust in the ship, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist up the main, main sail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the four parts stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And when and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that which commanded they that which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Uh, basically what I got from this chapter is the fact that uh, <clears throat> like as we always, as we all know, that nothing happens at, at random. You know, Paul warned them um, beforehand uh, that they won't lose their lives. However, the ship is done, you know, it's done. Um, meanwhile, in this generation, you would get like a tropical cyclone, which popped out of nowhere, you know, um, and all of that is just being credited to that, to that randomness instead of, of God trying to speak. So yeah, that's just what I got from, from the chapter. I like that again because it's a good this is what I mean there's so many different perspectives of learning in scripture and as you said the, the storms are very purposeful and it's funny because the storm had a name I don't know if anyone noticed that a storm called Euroclidon so I didn't really notice that before that they were naming storms like how oh, today you have Katrina and Hurricane George and all this. But um, these storms were not random, but purposeful. And there was a purpose in it to glorify God. And likewise, praise the Lord, which is why when I speak about some of the things that's been going on in the world recently, it's not for randomness, it's to bring glory to God. It's using these what they call natural disasters to give interpretation to give people understanding and to bring glory to what god's actually doing because without the interpretation of what's actually being done which is what apostle paul was doing it is random it is randomness and it is you could just jump off the boat at any time and even the principle that and i've shared this before but in in peter's case to step off of the boat was faith and to stay on the boat was unbelief but in paul's case staying in the boat was faith and stepping off was unbelief so you see god has a very individual purpose for us for some people he's saying to you you need to leave your job because that's the faith required of you and for other people he's saying no if you leave that's unbelief you're supposed to stay in your job we can't just say because peter walked off the boat we're all supposed to walk off of our buildings like just go to your workplace and walk off the building no for some people it's for some people it's to to step onto that unknown ground in in the sea right and that would be their faith move because why because it was the same principle of god doing the opposite of what you wanted or what you are and some people they're so comfortable in the boat god's like get out the boat and walk on the water otherwise you you don't have faith and for other people because they were so content to jump in the water paul's like no you need to stay in the boat so to me, that is always a beautiful thing in scripture to see the complete opposite commandments that they're receiving from God in these areas. There's a few more things, but I'll let um, Kaylee and whoever else wants to speak and I'll, and I'll come back to it. It's funny because uh, what you were just saying, um, I think I was speaking, I don't know if it was to Nicole or to my children earlier, and 
it's kind of like confirmation, but with Amazon, uh, the guy of Amazon, he had this like vision and he left his job for this, um, you know, vision that he felt like he needed to do. And I was basically saying that it's kind of like a confirmation to me um, personally, like, I don't think I am called in the workplace but for such, but rather the vision that God is asking me to do. Um, but yeah, so that was a confirmation to the conversation that I was having earlier. And then um, just, um, I don't know where the verses are, but I just got, um, sometimes people will not listen to us until calamity hits and there is no other option but God. So sometimes these storms and that happen and it's like you're warning people and you're warning them. And then it's like, was every option is kind of like there's no other option that's when people want to listen that's when people want to turn to God so even with the things that are happening around the world and with all these calamities and stuff that's happening in the end people want to hear the truth because they're not understanding why this keeps happening here there everywhere da, 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 da. and then when somebody comes in the name of the Lord uh, when God rises obviously um, a person to speak on his behalf they'll end up listening um, so that was uh, one point and then um, it was just where Paul was telling them to eat meat so this is another thing that I got how God cares about every detail of us and even to our health when Paul was getting them to eat meat for their health sake so yeah even just the little things God cares about and today they tell you don't eat meat because it's unhealthy Just pull that chapter up again because that reminded me of one particular thing. And again, everyone, just okay, be ready to share if you have anything to share. Um, pull that chapter up quickly. I just want to touch on something. And if there's anyone that wants to share in between that, feel free. So let's look at where they was eating meat and living their best life while the boat was going to hell <clears throat> or falling to pieces. Okay, you're in that place already. And while the day was coming and Paul besought them all to take meat, this day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. So they're fasting out of fear, right? They're fasting because they ain't got no appetite, because they're terrified. They're terrified. I'm sure in 2020, half 90% of the world probably started fasting. Um, they were terrified at the calamity, and that's when they choose that, you know, we're not going to eat. We just, we need to survive. We need to survive. And isn't it so contrary, because as believers, that's what we do. We contradict the world. Paul's like, this isn't the time to fast. Eat, drink, and be merry. And essentially, I pray for you, take some meat. This is for your health. So that no hair falls from your head. For you. In the middle of a boat, can, can you just picture that? Like A boat is being ripped and ravished to pieces. You're in the middle of the sea. You don't know if you're going to make it. A lot is, you're on the Titanic. And while the Titanic is, is getting ripped apart, you're like, oh, let's eat and drink because don't worry, God's going to save us. That's faith. That's faith. And you see, it would have looked like faith with the people fasting for 14 days, right? Oh, they're so they're so spiritual, they're fasting. No, they're fasting because they're afraid. That's really sad, actually. It's sad that people are moved to do things for God out of fear. So, oh, they're so spiritual because they're fasting. 14 days, they've gone without food. Yeah, I'm sure it was easy because of the fear. It's hard when you do it for sacrifice. It's probably easier to do it when you're afraid because when you're afraid, you don't even want to eat. So they probably forgot that they didn't even eat. They're all looking skinny and frail. And Paul's like, man, like, come on, man, you have to eat, eat up. And that was to their benefit as well, because it says they then threw away all the rest of the food off the boat and it lessened the weight. So, you know, there's that. Even though they may have got a bit heavier after eating, but nevertheless, that would fade away. And, um, but yeah, just interesting how in the time when, you see, 
2020 when the world was fasting and panicking and everybody was going to the mountains and everybody was believing in God all of a sudden. Meanwhile, some of us were eating and drinking. Remember 2020, I was, 2020 for me was very interesting because it was a year when I was doing a lot of room shopping and just a lot of luxury stuff. And people was like, well, you're just like living the opposite. Was, this is the time when everyone's panicking. And I lost my mom that year too. So don't, you know, it's not like, oh, it's just corona. I lost my mom that year too. Um, Not by corona, no way. But earlier that year. And yet that was a year that was really kind of a prosperous year in terms of a lot of things. It wasn't like the world, everyone's panicking, running around saying, oh, Psalms 91, Psalms 91, all unbelievers quoting Psalms 91, no pestilence can get me by night and by day. Uh, I just hope everyone's hearing what I'm saying in my passion. I just hope because 2020, everyone was a believer. Everyone was quoting Psalms 91. Every unbeliever was quoting Psalms 91. And I was on Facebook saying, sorry, but Psalms 91 doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you. You have to read to the end of the chapter. It's for the people who obey the commandments of the Lord. You can't just pick, pick it and declare it. It doesn't work that way. You have to read the whole chapter. And Christians were sending it out, giving people false hope too, which is demonic, and sending it to everyone. Don't worry, guys. Don't worry. Psalms 91. No, it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't work like that. So, um, yeah, Paul's telling them to eat and drink and be merry while the boat is in calamity. And that's how we are as believers. When the world's panicking, we're like, yo, let's get together and break bread. Praise the Lord. Okay. I was just thinking how the gathering was on Sunday. We were kind of like, even though there's like earthquakes and everything, we were still having joy. We wasn't really in fear or anything. We were kind of like eating and drinking and um, doing ball games. So, yeah, I'm very shook then. I know there was other things in this chapter, but nothing that I desperately have to get off my chest. Is there, um, Nicole? Or because Nicole, you're moving up and down the page. I'm wondering if you had something to say. Oh, and and if you do come through, and also anyone else, if you have anything, then I'll move on to the last chapter. We'll get ready to close. Um, you and Kaylee practically touched on what I was going to touch on. So just for time's sake, um. I don't really see the need to add anything else to it because you've both touched on it. No problem. I'll read through the last chapter. The last chapter. And just before we go to the last chapter, let me just see if that, that was a storm that was named Euroclidon or something. Sounded like some kind of Marvel movie character. <clears throat> <clears throat> the the a storm came upon us. A storm came upon us. The down when the storm came upon us. Can you see? I can't see. You can't see. Keep going down a bit. So no, it was. I don't think it was that far down. I don't think it was that far down. Uh, somewhere in, probably in the first, because the winds were contrary. So if I can't find it, I will move on. But. When we had uh, Sicily sitting in the and when we were the uh, scars, and then uh, something, something kicking on. And then now, uh, when the time was spent, and we were sitting and doing the first, first was in the there, and Paul finished there, and I presume the word would be, and then. Nah, nah, I think I'm just, I'm probably rushing it because I want to get to it quickly, so I can't see it. I know it was there, just. Oh, there it is. So, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had up obtained their purposes losing thence. They sailed close by Crete, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. <clears throat> the wind was called Euroclidon? That's interesting. Yeah, because I didn't know that they was doing that whole naming storms from back then. So that means there was like a big storm that the government 
Fully the Roman thing, isn't it? Because we're still under the Romans. When we're reading about the Romans in the chapters, by the way, saints, we're still under the Romans because the Britons are just a breakaway of the Romans. You get it? Like the Western world, it's all the same people. They just had different islands and the Britons basically took over the Roman Empire. The Britons took over the world and now they dominate. Before that, Romans dominated during the time of Jesus. So when you see even the behavior of the Romans, um, it's very similar to the behavior of the the European Empire, sorry, the British Empire, and even in the last chapter, that was, that was one thing that I, that I saw that was interesting. When Paul was saying his testimony about everything he heard, at the end of it, I think it was Felix or one of the Roman governors said, Paul, he shouted at the top of his voice and said, Paul, you're beside yourself. You're mad. You're crazy. But then after that, he's like, but yeah, we don't have anything to kill you for, so it's all good. So still today, like the Europeans have this you know, kind of way about them where it's like, they think it's foolishness if it's, as the Bible says, the Greeks look for wisdom and the Jews look for power or a sign. So the Greeks are always looking for philosophy. And that's why throughout history, there's been so many European philosophers that have come up and then we learn about them in university and school and Hippocrates and all these kind of people, um, Europeans, because that's what they love. As the Bible says, they love seeking knowledge. And, and that's why they dominate with science today, which has replaced God. But nevertheless, let's move on to the last chapter. Okay, last chapter, in chapter 28. Um, and and I, I quoted earlier a verse where God doesn't live in human hands. So maybe it was a different place of Acts, because I thought it was Acts 27, but maybe it was Acts something or 27. If it's not 28, then it means we've already read it, maybe. Um, and when they were escaped and they knew that the island was called Melita and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness for they kindled a fire and perceived us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cloud. So what is it saying here? And when they escaped and they knew and they knew that the island was called Melita and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness for they kindled a fire. So is that the bush people they're talking about, the barbarians, the people that lived indigenously perhaps. And it said they kindled a fire for them in the bushes on this island and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. I just like to pick out stuff like that when I'm reading. I feel like it's edifying even for the saints so that we look deeper than the overall story, but also see some of the details in there as well. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. So he's just been bitten by a poisonous snake. He's grabbed onto Apostle Paul's hand. And when the barbarians, okay, it is the barbarians then. And when the barbarians, which would, that's kind of a derogatory term for people that live what they would call uncivilized, which probably was uncivilized, like the Native Americans or the indigenous. Uh, barbarians saw that the venomous beast hang on his hand. They said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom he has escaped at the sea and vengeance has not suffered him to live. And he, Apostle Paul, he shook off the beast, speaking of the snake, he shook it off into the fire, and guess what, saints? He felt no harm. Now, just a quick pause, because people will say, the scripture where Jesus says, you shall speak with tongues, you shall pick up serpents, and they shall bite you. Some believers say, oh no, you know, that wasn't in the original text. He doesn't literally mean you can pick up snakes. The reason believers say stuff like that is because they're embarrassed of the word of God. Believers are so embarrassed by the word of God, it's embarrassing that they're embarrassed. They're so embarrassed that they don't like to say stuff like that. So they'll say, oh no, no, we believe the scholars have told us that wasn't in the original manuscripts. Well, whether or not you believe it was in the original manuscripts, it happened. Apostle Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake, shook it off, and felt no harm. Six, howbeit they looked when he had, when he, uh, howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down. They was waiting for him to swell up or fall down suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their mind Come on, is that not funny? Is that not funny? And said he was a god. 
was they not just saying this is some wicked murderer that escaped look at him he's being condemned and now all of a sudden oh uh, hmm. oh maybe he's not a murderer after all oh maybe, maybe he's a god do you think he's a god yeah maybe he's a god um look at the extreme dramatic nature of humans hosanna hosanna crucify him wickedness exposing the wickedness of the human nature one day they look at you look at you dirty murderer that's why you got bitten that's why you had your bike accident that's why you're in a wheelchair and then in the next minute they turn around and they see what god done hmm. oh maybe maybe you're wrong they called him a god they thought he was a god it's trash it's just extremities of trash okay <laughs> in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously and it came to pass that the father of Publius laid sick of a fever and of a bloody flux funny whatever that means um to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him the same man that they were just saying he's a murderer because he got bitten by a snake uh, prayed and laid hands on him and healed him so when this was done others also which was diseased in the island and they had diseases in the island came and were healed praise the lord the prisoners being sent to this unknown random barbarian island and within a space of a matter of hours the islands bringing all their sick people out praise god what like where are we having that impact impact today in society that's the impact we should have today wherever we go as believers that's what we're working towards saints let's not settle for anything less we should be on the train we should be in our workplace in the school wherever you are and people should be coming to us for healing now that's not to say if that's not happening is something wrong because we have seasons and we're all going through seasons but i'm just saying let's aspire to that because that's what we're here for we're not here for anything else we're here to demonstrate christ on earth and so that was very normal sending their sick people to be healed and they were healed who also honored us with many honors and when they he we departed they laded us with such things as were necessary and after three months we departed and i just want to say something quickly nicole this is a thought yeah i just want to share this thought with you because there's something interesting because you see what you're saying earlier about sometimes the other disciples were a bit compromised right luke you realize luke is the one right in this book right luke and Luke is literally, you don't really see him doing anything. He's just there. Like he's just writing about what Paul did. And it struck out to me when Luke was on the boat, writing the text. And he's like, well, we was on the boat. And then it looked like there was no hope. But then Apostle Paul came out and said, don't worry. And it's like, so I'm, is Luke, did you believe Luke too? Or did you, was you doubting? Because Luke is writing all of this stuff. Like Paul did this, Paul did that, Paul did this. Paul um, got bit by a snake. Paul was bold, Paul was... So it's interesting. I'm not, Luke is, a, is an apostle. Praise the Lord. He's in honor. But it's just interesting to know what was his part to play. Was you just bystanding and documenting or did you also help Paul with healing people and things like that? Um, and so uh, after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had withered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux, and landing at Syracuse. Syracus, we tarried there three days, and from thence we fetched compass. We fetched a compass and came to Regium, and, and after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, like so many different names, um, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went towards Rome, and from thence, when the brethren heard uh, of us, they came to meet us as far as happy forum happy happy forum and the three taverns whom when paul saw he thanked god and took courage and when we came to rome the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard but paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him okay uh, paul was getting a lot of favor by the way There's something else you notice in these chapters he's getting a lot of favor it's okay don't take him away put him there let him have visitors it's okay don't stop the visitors from coming to see him and it came to pass that and that's amazing because joseph when he was taken as a prisoner also got favor when you're a believer you get favor anywhere you go praise the lord 
And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, um, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered um, prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had, who when they had, um, when they had, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you. To speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, we neither received. One second. Okay, and 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 they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning you, neither any of the brethren that came showed uh, or spoke any harm of you, but we desired to hear uh, of you what you think as for as concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. That's interesting. Um, and when they appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Now, first of all, could have been sitting here complaining, whining, crying. It's not fair. Black lives matter. Jewish lives matter. Israel lives matter. Benjamin lives matter. Call the president. I'm on a boat. I'm on a prison. I'm on an island. It's not fair. What's the democracy? Blah, blah. Paul's preaching the gospel while he's being persecuted, thrown in prison, kicked out of every society. And this guy is dedicating his time to preach the word to people, not complain and say Benjamin lives matter. Or Benjamite lives matter. Um, so, teaching about the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Like, praise the Lord, what a delight to share the word of God. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. Um, Palestine lives matter. And when they agreed not among themselves, they the pride departed after that. Um, Paul had spoken one word, well, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet um, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. As we were saying earlier, they hear, they don't understand, they see, they don't perceive, they're blind. For the heart of this people is waxed gross. So the reason is their heart is waxed gross. So the reason Jews and Muslims and, and the unbelievers can't see today and the scientists is why? Because they, they, they hear, but they don't understand. They see, but they don't perceive. Your heart is waxed gross. That goes to anyone who hears the gospel and still can't get it and still doesn't believe it. And where did Jesus say I'm God? Jesus didn't say I'm God. How can he be God? The heart is waxed gross, those people. Because Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice and they'll believe me. And their eyes are dull of hearing and their ear and their and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them so they've been blinded and deafened as well but it but it be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of god sent unto the gentiles and they that will hear it and that they will hear it um and when he had said those words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Um, so, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. What's the next chapter after that? Is that Romans? Okay, very good. Go back. 
Um, praise God. So you see, the end of this chapter here, the end of this chapter, is going to be the context of a lot of the letters that we're going to see. Because you see, Paul is in prison here. He's going through prison. He's, he's in like house arrest. He's on house arrest in his own house, like Andrew Tate was for half a year. He's on house arrest. He's getting favor, right? But he's also writing letters during these exploits. So the letters that we're going to begin reading as of next week, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, a lot of the letters are going to be him writing from prison, which is very good um, and stuff. So yeah, praise God. Um, I think in summary, what can I say? In summary, um, yeah, just, just the way how, you know, all of that chaos has happened. He's landed on this island. And the first thing he's doing there is just preaching Christ. He's not promoting his music video. He's not promoting a book that he's trying to write. He's not selling anything. He's not like, hey, guys, I'm the CEO of tentmaking.com because he was a tent maker. He's not promoting his website. He's out here just, just like, listen, Christ, 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 Christ. It's all about Christ. It's sad because today it's all about the face of the preacher. It's all about the face of the YouTuber. It's all about like, comment, and subscribe. Oh, congratulations. I got 100,000 followers. Where are they following you to? Your bedroom. Where are they following you to? Where are you going? Um, but Paul's on this island stranded with barbarian people, right? And all he can think to do is address the Jews and correct them, address the people and heal them and preach the gospel to them. That's the life of a believer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And and no, not everyone's going to be an apostle for. Not everybody is going to, God expects that you're going to be crashing into islands and landing on desert islands and preaching and all of that. It's not that. But the point is, he's an example, though. At least we have to look like that. At least, at least you can crash into your neighbor's house or you can crash into the shop or you can crash into your workplace or crash into... You know, in the context, and, and then preach the gospel or share the gospel in every opportunity that you get. Um, praise God! So, the life of a believer. Um, the whole chapter just paints the story of the life of the apostles, and the way. But it's just casual for Paul, though. Like again, this the way Paul's doing it is just this kind of casual way. Like, yeah, just eat. Just the snake just bit me. And he just shook off the snake. He didn't complain against the snake. He didn't complain and say, it's not, you know, I want to speak to the government. The snake shouldn't have been there. Just shake off the snake and just preach the gospel. Just whatever. They bit me. It, they've tried to poison me. It's okay. It's okay. Let's let's talk about Jesus. And do you know that makes Satan more angry? Do you know that makes people more angry? Do you know it makes people so angry when you don't respond to their, to their uh, attacks? Do you know how angry? Do you know how unworthy satan feels when he can't get your attention when you're like resist the devil and you're free the bible says resist him just just turn away don't even look at him just ignore the devil just ignore his voice you know how angry that makes the enemy because that's how the enemy operates you know when they want attention the enemy the devil the enemy physical enemies or spiritual enemies they want attention don't they they want to intimidate you they want to bully you they want to make you feel shy they want to make you feel nervous they want to make you feel insecure they want to make you feel like you're afraid to speak they want to make you feel like you're unworthy they want to make you feel like you have nothing to offer. And do you know the most humiliating thing you can do to the enemy is just do what Apostle Paul done. Just look, guys, did you eat yet? Like, guys, have you heard about Jesus? Like, just take that attention from you and from them and just put it back to Christ. Let's just focus on Christ. That annoys people. It really does. I know that's why a lot of like my own family um, wouldn't really come to my house and stuff because... It, it, one thing I always I didn't do is I didn't preach to people when they used to come visit me. I didn't do that. So people say, "Oh yeah, when you preach, when you preach the gospel," with me it wasn't preaching. I I directly didn't preach to my family. I would just what I would do is I'll just be there because I know preaching is an abomination. So I'll be there. But what it is is no matter what I do, when you ask me a question, Jesus is incorporated. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. You ask me, what have I been doing lately? I've just been with the Lord. I can't avoid it. I can't, I can't, I can't have fake conversations. I can't say, you know, I'm just here. I'm just chilling. I'm just nothing. Like when you ask me a question, when an unbeliever asks me a question, when the, when the, when the postman asks me a question, when the plumber asks me a question, 
when the doctor comes to my house, they try to do their visits every once in a while, even though I just reject everything that they come to offer. But no matter what, it comes back to Jesus. Sometimes they'll be asking me questions, and I'm like, what do you do in your spare time? I, I'm with Jesus. What do you do? I fellowship. Oh, yeah, no, but what else do you Jesus, fellowship. Yeah, no, yeah, we know that, but what else? Like That's happened so many times with me when they do these little forms that they have to fill out in hospital in London as well. They, you have to write down, and it's Jesus. What do you do? Jesus. How come you've been able to manage your mental health? Jesus. How come you, Jesus? What are you, Jesus? And um, yeah, they don't want that. They run. They run quickly. Yeah. But it's like, what else can I say? Like, there's nothing else to say. I'm only here because of Jesus. I'm only doing this Bible study with y'all because of Jesus. I'm sure you know it's the same for you. Why Why else would we be here? We could all be here watching movies right now. We could all be here with your girlfriend and your boyfriend. And well, how much other things could be with here because of Jesus? You know what I mean? Isn't there a lot of other things the flesh would be? I'm sure a lot of you want to sleep right now. Oh, and you could just like yeah you know bible studies i get it you know if that's what it is i get it but we're here because of jesus we're here because of christ that's why i'm here anyway i'm here because of christ and so where else is there to turn there's nowhere else to go it's, it's that's our and therefore when someone asks a question christ is going to be incorporated in the answer otherwise for me i'm not speaking for anyone else but otherwise you end up lying you end up denying christ for the sake of entertaining a conversation and again i'm not even saying you have to go out your way and preach to the man that comes to build to plumb your house oh you need to repent no no let him plumb your house let him do what he's doing in peace you don't have to harass people that's not the point the point is if a question or a conversation naturally arises or you feel spontaneously led to bring one up then in that case you have no you have every obligation to represent what you believe without denying what you believe for the sake of appeasing the likes of the world. Praise the Lord, saints. Amen. <clears throat> Any more additions before we wrap it up? I liked the last few chapters because even, I believe it was Owetu that was saying it before in the last chapter, how everything's just orchestrated by God and you kind of see that in the last few chapters of Paul getting in the boat and crash land into a random barbaric land and people being healed and all these miracles happening and then going from different places when he was directly meant to just be going to one place that was the plan at first but then you know God has his way of orchestrating things his way basically so um, it kind of just shows you like how secure our life is in God, even when Paul in the chapter previously said that, you know, this storm is going to be harmful even to our lives. And um, Paul didn't really have a choice but to go in the boat because they still decided that they were not going to listen and still go. But even then God is with him. So obviously nothing was going to happen to him because he was secure in God. So it shows that security that we have in Christ as well, that he's the one orchestrating everything and we don't need to worry about tomorrow or what's going to happen in that way because it's God that um that keeps us secure and safe you know can we add to our life just by worrying about what's going to happen so um yeah I like the way that you can see that it's orchestrated by God and I just thought the barbaric people I know that's not probably their name but I just they, they're kind of funny the way that they thought um, judgment came upon Paul because he was bitten by the snake and that's very funny but I was thinking as well at least in a way they, even though they were the other extreme they kind of knew that certain things could mean a judgment as today we're the other extreme because of science have explained everything away <coughs> and made everything so physical and natural and there's no spiritual aspect <coughs> we're the other extreme of there's no judgment there's no judgment of God and it's just natural disasters and it's just you're either lucky or unlucky. Like you're just unlucky that you got hit by a tsunami or something, or you got bitten by a snake and died. It's just either you're lucky or unlucky. So I was thinking how, you know, today we're the other extreme of thinking there's no judgment whatsoever. And back then, because they recognised that there can be judgment, they may have been on the other extreme of thinking probably everything was a judgment, even when it wasn't. So <clears throat> I was just thinking how, you know, again, it's two different extremes between back then. And now where they're thinking that, you know, because he got bitten by a snake, that it was a judgment because he was some kind of murderer. Um, and then I thought it was funny that 
um, they thought he was a god, which yeah, happened to Paul a few yeah. times. Uh, there was a time yeah. when it was him and Barnabas, no, and no, I think he did a miracle or healed somebody. And again, they thought him and Barnabas were like gods, and they called one of the Mer- is it Mercury, and the other one I forgot what they called Jupiter or something. And uh, they was going to do human sacrifice onto them because they thought they were a god. And um, I've noticed I had this revelation before that by default of when you're walking in God's power, people can start to look at you like you're a God. Not that you receive the glory of people, that you are a God, because obviously you do what exactly what Paul did and the apostles, which is, you know, what Peter said to Cornelius, don't bow down to me, I'm just a man like you, but Jesus Christ is Lord kind of thing. You'll give the glory um, directed right back to God, but there seems to be this thing where because of your moving in God's power, they start to think you're like a God or something, um, which seems to be um, just like a reaction that people give. So I thought that was quite interesting as well. Just as you're saying that, I was going to say that um, it's like you're moving in God's power, so people will think like you're a God, even though you're not a God, but because you're moving in the power of God, they will see the reflection of God through you. And that's obviously, like you said, when you tell them that it's Jesus. Amen. And, it, and it's really sad because, and this is good, and I'm accountable to let everyone know this, but there is a wind of doctrine in the church today. I, I think they're called cessationalists or something like that. And there's a few documentaries. One of them was called American Christianity or the American Gospel Trash um just as a disclaimer um because there's this and and it's, it's one of those trash it's, it's the type of trash that you won't recognize it as trash unless it's kind of unless you have discernment or unless it's explained to you so i'll just kind of quickly break it down so no one else falls into no one ever falls into this deception but there's a doctrine today that as katie and nicole was just talking about we should be operating operating in such a way that even unbelievers who you know who are ignorant of who god is can see you as a god right that was biblically historical god says i'm going to make moses like a god to israel um the, it's because you're operating in the power of god and they don't understand how a human can do that and so yes because we don't see it in the church no one really credits that to christians they more so accredit it to doctors like gods i'll get to that but um there's a way we're supposed to move right in power authority healing the sick raising the dead but there's a wind of doctrine today that is this kind of it's this false humility whereby we're supposed to be humble and God only has to heal you if he wants to and God only has to do it if he wants to and we don't have they come hard against what they call the word of they're combating this word of faith movement which is apparently the people who speak it into existence and speak and declare and you're healed so it's a combat against that now I'm of neither side but I lean more towards word of faith if if they want to call it that I'm not offended because word of faith is biblical speaking in faith speaking words of faith is biblical so they come against this and they call it sorcery actually they're calling it sorcery and witchcraft to try to speak things into existence even though witches use it it's biblical the bible says that we speak things that are not as though they are so you speak things that are not as though they are when there's no light you say let there be light to create light we are in the image of god so yes that's what healing is it's not begging god to heal someone it's laying hands and saying be healed it's saying rise up and walk peter didn't say to the crippled man you know please god please please just look at me please just please just heal him he just said silver and gold i don't have but what i do have what's that power rise up and walk silver and gold i don't have but what i do have i give to you rise up and walk so let's not fall into this trash about you know we're just humble meek you know dusty christians we don't have anything unless god no god gave you that's what ephesians is about he's given you every spiritual blessing he's given us authority and dominion let's not walk around pretending to be humble that's not humble denying the power of god is not humble that's actually demonic because the bible says that stay away from those who deny the power of the spirit let me say that again the bible says stay away from those who have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof do not even eat with such people so these very people running around saying that oh yeah we but they're not going to say they deny the power by the way we believe in the spirit but the spirit's job is to transform you into holiness it sounds cute no but the spirit's job is also to make you walk in dominion and power and authority over diseases and sicknesses too 
So let's never cave into the false humility doctrine of, you know, we're just humble sinners that have to beg God for everything. No, you don't. No, you don't. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Um, we're called to operate in power. That's the bare minimum, actually. Jesus says, don't rejoice that demons come out at your will. That's basic. That's basic. So praise God. Um, I don't think there was anything more particularly. That's, that's, again, I feel like there was some other stuff, but um, nothing too particular. Any more um, last words, please, saints? Yeah, just on what you were saying about those people that are trying to combat word of faith or whatever they call it. They just kind of sound like they lack faith and they're just offended for whatever personal reason that they're offended. But it sounds like it just stems out of like lack of faith for whatever reason and they're just offended. Usually when people go to the other extreme, it's out of offence, some kind of personal offence. And yeah, just to confirm that a lot of their testimonies are, well, I prayed for God to heal my wife from cancer and he never did. And I was so discouraged and I've been told all these years that God will heal you if you have faith. And all these years I was beating myself up thinking I don't have enough faith to be healed. And then I realized yeah, it was all a lie and he didn't have to heal her. And now we're living comfortable with the cancer and cancer is our friend and we love God. And it's like, yeah, that's not biblical and that's not Bible doctrine that we're taught. Cancer is not your friend. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of them do have the testimony that they prayed and prayed and prayed. It would be me. It would be like me saying, well, I prayed eight years to come out of a wheelchair, which I haven't, by the way. But it'd be like me doing that and then saying, well, God didn't heal me. And, and, and the arrogance of not humbling yourself and saying maybe you didn't have faith. Instead, let's just say the doctrine is false. It's not about faith. It's just that God didn't want to heal me. That's arrogance, because what you're actually saying is it's not that you don't have faith. It's that God doesn't want to heal you. But the Bible actually says, according to your faith, you shall be healed. And the Bible also says, because of their unbelief, Jesus could not heal them. So it's, it's right there. Like, what are people arguing about? He says, if you don't have faith, you can't be healed. And if you do have faith, you can be healed. And then he says, according to your level of faith, you'll be healed. And then the teaching is, measure, don't measure yourself above measure, but act according to the faith you have. And it says, if you prophesy, prophesy according to your measure of faith. That means not everyone in this room has the same measure of faith. But we all have faith, but not on the same measure. So somebody in this room might have faith to move a mountain. Somebody might have faith to walk on water. Somebody in this room might have faith just to, um, I don't even know, what's a low version of faith? Um, to, I don't want to use a low version just in case it's there. But anyway, uh, you know, there's different levels or there's, there's small faith and there's big faith. But nevertheless, you're, you, God's only going to judge you according to the faith that he gave you, right? I don't know if anyone can think of a, a small version of operating in faith, like a really minuscule one, like um, praying in public or something like that. Anyway, uh, lastly, there was one more thing. There was one more thing. Yeah, speaking of gods, when they'll see an apostle Paul as a god, I just want to say to everyone, we still do the same today, okay? We don't. Let's not ever romanticize the idea of what it looks like when they said, they thought he was a god okay when you romanticize it you think oh nobody does that today we're not that foolish but this is the thing idolatry still exists today and idol worship still exists today because that's in the new testament and so why don't we see people bowing down to statues and bowing down to zeus and saying we worship this man no that's not what it looks like today to see someone as a god all you have to do is go to a jay-z concert all you have to do is go to a michael jackson concert don't romanticize the idea of what it looks like to worship someone. Having pictures of a celebrity all over your wall, that's worship. Okay? So when we th when we say they was calling Apostle Paul a god, don't think it's be when you idolize someone, it's bowing down. Just like Mary, when people say, oh, we don't worship her, we just, it's worship. Reverence, adoration, pictures, worship. Okay? Michael Jackson was worship. When he touched people, they fell down, just like how people do in church. When Jay-Z's in a concert, he puts his hands up. In this sign, they all do the sign. That's worship. So, and today, I wanted to say the doctors, they are the ones who are worshipped today. 
okay because you go there that's the first thing that comes to people's mind when they get a headache doctor 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 and these doctors are pagans these doctors worship buddha these doctors are hindu most of them are muslim which is the greatest enemies of christian but the christians are flocking to them every day please doctor please please just give me some medication please doctor and then they say doctor you should come to our church he's like i don't want to go to your church your, your god's powerless um and so yes we still have gods today right none of us in this room amen but there are gods whereby you're idolizing a person and making them your god it doesn't mean you bow to them and say they're my god if the doctor says jump and you say how high every time that's your god you know so let it be only jesus that can tell us to jump and we say how high oh, or a woman's husband if she's married praise god kaylee and then we'll close up um it just reminds me of a conversation i had with the uh, doctors the other day uh basically and they were trying to come to my door this charity from a hospital and they were basically saying um asking money to basically help these sick kids and i basically was telling them i don't believe in medication and stuff like that and then I said to them um, about, you know, how Jesus heals people for free and that he uh, performs miracles and stuff. And then they tried to turn around and say that they also do miracles. So they was trying to put themselves on the same level as Jesus. And like, these are the doctors. They think that they are gods anyway. I'm glad you said that. Good confirmation just to show that it's a reality and they are arrogant, as cute as they look with their little suits and they're like, oh, we're just humble. Well, you know, we just want to help people. But just as Katie just said, that's the kind of, I was in hospital for two years, two, nearly two, four years, one in Brazil for a whole year and one in England for a whole year. I see what's on the inside. Okay, I see what it's like when you're being persecuted by these doctors. I was hated in London by doctors, by one particular doctor at least hated my guts because i wouldn't believe anything he said i wouldn't yield to him i was not rude i was humble but just because i didn't bow to his recommendation of you're gonna die if you don't take this you're gonna die in a few years if you don't take that and i'm like I, i'm i follow christ christ is the that was the most offensive thing so you and he was so nice to everyone before that but with me he couldn't be because because of the offense of christ but eventually he declared from his own mouth true because god must be real and many of them declared from their own mouths, um, you know, what God was demonstrating, the power of God. There's so many testimonies in that regard in where he said things from his own mouth that were prophetic and it's working for him. So anyway, um, yeah, so let's let's know what idolatry looks like in this day and age. And, you know, uh, and again, point. let's be offended so that we can point people back to Jesus when every minute they run into doctor and worshiping doctor and doctor medication, doctor this, doctor said you shouldn't eat meat, doctor. What did Christ say? What are we saying? Let's stand up, saints. And as Katie said, also in Germany, they call the doctors, my German carer that I had before, she said in Germany, they call the doctors the gods in white. So just as another conversa uh, confirmation, they call them the gods in white. So there you go. Praise God. Um, I'm assuming no one has anything urgent to say. I would love if anyone did, but I'm also happy to close if no one does. So anyone with any last thoughts or summarizing thoughts? I'll give a minute. Praise God, my sister Tia, would you be able to close us in prayer? Lord. So we just want to show our appreciation um, to you, Lord, for everything that you reveal to us, everything that you show us, Lord, and that we deeply value your word, that we um, know that your word is 
the foundation of all things that we rely on, Father God, that anything that is in contradiction to your word is false. And that um and that your word is inspired, Lord, that that you are the one who um leads us in the in the truth of understanding, Father God, in the words that you um have given us, Father God. I just want to pray as well, Lord, that um we will just continue to be just so free flowing in the spirit that we will not structure our lives in such a way where we um, try and go about things our own way um, rather than letting the Holy Spirit to be the one to lead us. Um, as we see with um, Paul, Lord, we see just how free he was in just doing whatever it was that the spirit was guiding him to do. And it's just very inspirational, Father God, because, you know, we know that is the life of a believer which you expect from us to just be able to always be guided by you and not be led by ourselves and uh, follow the narrative of, of, our, of the type of lives that we want to live in our flesh, Father God, but just wanting to just follow the ways in which is led by the Spirit, Father. So we just give thanks, God, that you know, as the uh, times that we're living living in now, you know, with um, persecution is on the horizon, Lord, and we just can feel it coming. But we just pray, Father, for strength. We pray for boldness, even more so in this season, to be able to stand for the truth, and um, where it's easy for um, Christians of this day to cower and you know hide from the responsibility that you have given us as as believers Lord um, to just really stand even more firmly in in your word and you know be an example to the nation be an example to um, the people around us that you know that we are able to be the ones that can provide answers as to what is actually going on um, to research so that we can be representatives of you in that way and lead people to you. So we just pray, Father, that as we go about um, our days, Lord, from this point onwards, that we just always keep in mind um, of the way you want us to live and just um, always being able to give account of you whenever the um, opportunity arises. And so we just like to pray over the saints in this room and who even weren't able to join the Bible study this evening, Father. And I just pray for um, just your covering over them and that your presence will just remain with us for the rest of this week, Lord. And we just thank you and we close this prayer in your holy, mighty name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen, saints. One second, saints. One second, saints. One second. I just need to share this before you go. Um, Tia said something very prophetic and it was something that I just want to highlight before we leave here. Tia said, let's not structure our lives in such a way that we miss, you know, the free flow of what God wants to do. Um, that, that was a confirmation to me because I, I, I feel led to say this, right? And believe me, this is not directed at anyone, no one. There's no one on my mind, but I just I, spiritually, I feel like this is necessary to say. There are, there are some people in here, right, who...